Well, good morning and welcome. It's a great pleasure to see uh, so many students from uh, Heathcote School and Science College, Twickenham School, St. Michael's Catholic College and Westminster City School. We're really pleased to have you all here today and I hope it's going to be an enjoyable session. You probably know, but in case you don't, the reason we're holding this uh, legal profession across the profession event is because we're celebrating uh, the uh, centenary of the first female barrister. Ivy Williams was born in 1877. She was the daughter of an Oxford solicitor and she was educated at home and then uh, went to Oxford and took several degrees at Oxford and she got her degrees in October 1920. And she had campaigned for many years before that for women to be allowed to be barristers. And finally, on the 10th of May, 1922, so tomorrow, 100 years ago, she was called to the bar and became the first ever woman barrister. And that's what we're celebrating today. And that's why we've got a panel of four women. So uh, there are lots of men in the, in, in the uh, professions, you know that, but that's why we are a, a panel of four. So I'm going to start just by saying a little bit about how I got to be sitting in this chair here. And then I'm going to ask my fellow panelists to say a little bit about their journey. And then we're going to hear your excellent questions and try to answer your excellent questions. So I uh, was not born in this country. I was actually born in South Africa. We left South Africa because of apartheid and we came to this country when I was nine. Um, and I found school really difficult. I was quite behind because school in South Africa started much later and I struggled a bit. Um, and then a Japanese girl, um, and I remember her name, Naue Ono, I haven't seen her for about 40 years probably, joined my class. And Naue Ono um, got top marks. She'd only just come to the school and I was thinking, well, why isn't she finding it difficult? It's hard for me, and why is she getting top marks in everything? And I was very competitive, and so I thought, well, oh, I'm going to beat her. And I started working really hard, and sure enough, after a few years of really hard work, I got either top marks, and now he was second, or she got top marks, and I was second, and it became a competition all the way through school. So I'm really grateful to now Aona for showing me that it's possible with a lot of hard work. Uh, and then I had to decide what I wanted to do, and I wanted to be an actor. I didn't want to be a barrister. I didn't want to be a, a solicitor. I wanted to be an actor, and my parents said, don't be ridiculous. You'll end up having to be a waiter and a shop assistant in order to fund your career. It's a good thing to do as a hobby, but it's hopeless, hopeless to do as a career. And I argued with them for years about it. Um, and in the end, we compromised and they said, get a degree, then you'll have something to fall back on. Uh, and you can go to acting school after, which was kind of clever of them. But anyway, so I did get a degree. I got a law degree. And then while I was doing my law degree, one of the tutors, one of the people who was teaching me was talking about careers and he looked at a group of us, and there were men and women in the room, and he said to all the men, are you interested in the bar? He, was, he had been a barrister. Um, and they all said, yes, yes, they're very interested, and he talked to them about it. And then he said to all the women, what about the solicitors? And I said, well, what about the bar? And he said, oh, no, the bar's no place for a woman. So once again, my competitive <laughs> instinct kicked in, and I thought, rubbish. I think I'll be a barrister then. And I switched from acting and I thought, right, that's it. I'm going to be a barrister. So I worked really hard and I became a barrister and I loved the bar. And I was at the bar for nearly 30 years. And it was great. Sometimes it was really hard. It was hard work all the way through, but sometimes it was too hard. Uh, but then there were other times where it was great and I did a case that I felt was a 
good case and I'd helped somebody and I'd found a solution to a problem or argued in court and my argument had been accepted by the judge. And I really loved it. And I can't, uh, I can't recommend strongly enough a career at the bar for anyone who is willing to work hard uh, and to persevere and to be resilient because there are lots of challenges. Um, and then after 30 years, I decided to become a judge. But one of you has asked a question about that, so I won't say any more. What I'll do now is I'll hand over to Caroline Jepson, who is the president of Silex. Silex is the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives, and she'll tell you about her journey. Thank you. Uh, morning, everybody. Yes, I'm Caroline. I'm a chartered lawyer. Uh, I'm now the current president of, of Silex. Um, in addition, I run my own business, um, employing about 60 people um, across three health and fitness centres in Sheffield, actually, so slightly left field. Um, in addition to that, I also do um, brain injury case management, which means working with survivors of brain injuries and, and their families. Uh, but I started my career working at a very small uh, law firm in South Yorkshire at the age of 17. I was working as, working as an office junior, earning £50 a week and uh, living with my parents. Um, I moved to a slightly bigger law firm um, in the city of Sheffield, um, around 19, I think. And I um, there I heard about the organisation that is Silex. And what I discovered is that you could um, study with Silex to gain your legal qualification whilst working in legal practice, which is exactly what I did. So I worked um, for worked at, worked full time and studied for four years, um, doing my academic studies. And what that enabled me to do was to gain the experience of working on the job on a day to day basis, but also doing obviously part time studies. So I was able to apply the uh, you know what I was learning in my studies to practice everyday real life situations, which was hugely beneficial. I um, worked. Um, through various departments within, within that law firm, and I um, discovered brain injury, or, or should I say serious injury litigation, so people that have suffered um, life-changing injuries, and I represented them from a legal perspective, so um, represented claimants in, in actions. Um, and that's where I really found my, um, although I hate this word, but I will use it in my passion, I discovered that I really um, wanted to help people that have suffered these awful um, life-changing circumstances and, and enable them to improve their lives. So I did that for several years. And more recently, I've gone into the, the re rehabilitation side of things. So I now help the same families, uh, actually, um, but, but more from a um, rehabilitation perspective. In addition to all that, uh, my one of my other passions is always been in health and fitness. And I've qualified as a personal trainer many years ago, but just did that as a hobby. Um, and what I found was I was getting lots of referrals um, actually from solicitors to work with their injured clients. So I was working very much part of the um, rehab, rehab team, but more from a hands-on perspective, um, which is the link with the, with the gyms and then eventually becoming the owner of, of three gyms. Um, so um, slightly unusual, but I've been able to forge careers in many different sectors, again, which I know there's a question on that later, uh, and I've um, managed to knit them all together um, to be where I am today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. Now we're going to hear from Dawn Gibbons. Good morning and welcome to this wonderful Royal Courts of Justice. Great. It's a privilege for me to be here this morning. Um, my story is going to be very, very different. Um, I'm an ex-McDonald's employee. <laughs> I started McDonald's in 1984 when I was 16, part-time whilst I was in the sixth form at my secondary school in SW18 postcode. And I started on a, in, a hourly rate of one pound and 34 pence. And I actually thought at that time, I was rich because you're living at home with your parents and you're thinking you've got actually your own money in your pocket. 
Now, in those days at McDonald's, you'd be mopping the floor, you'd be scrubbing, all different things, because at the end of the day, it is a restaurant that people visit. And my friends from school who had either left or, you know, were in other years in different colleges um, would come in and laugh at me. But at the end of the day, I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I wanted to go into law. I wanted to be able to work um, eventually in somewhere like this. So it was regardless of the £1.34 pence, I had an ambition. Um, my parents are South American. Anyone here from Guyana? Okay, Guyana is on the north coast of South America. It's the only English-speaking country in South America. And my parents came over here and they met, um, fell in love, and then my dad was studying to be a civil engineer, and he got a contract to go to Zambia. And that's where I was born in 1968. I came here and then went to school and college and university, <clears throat> excuse me. And then when I got to 20, I decided I was going to, I was still working at McDonald's, but I was going to take some time out, whether, if, whether it was to travel or, you know, just do something completely different. And then I saw a job for Nationwide Anglia Building Society. <clears throat> Anybody know what that is? A nationwide Anglia? It's now a nationwide building society. And they deal, they're like a bank. They deal in finances, current accounts, savings. So I saw an advert and I thought, okay, I'll do that for a year. That turned into 30. <laughs> yes. And I became a senior manager in various roles there. So that's a little bit about me. I'm, I'm nearly 54 next month. And... My story is it doesn't matter where you start, it's about where you finish. And there's gonna be some barriers along the way, but always have that focus and determination. Thank you, Dawn. And just tell us um, for, uh, very quickly, because I know people are gonna ask questions yes. about being a magistrate. I, I decided to become a magistrate in 2017. I was on the tube and I saw this advert, would you like to become a magistrate? And I'd always wanted to do law, as you've heard from a very young age. And I thought, actually, I think that's got my name on it. And I decided to apply. At that time, it took, it took nearly two years of various checks and authorizations by the Lord Chief Justice, who is the head of the judiciary, yep. magistrates, but everyone yep. that is in court. He had to approve all magistrates. And that background check, make sure that you know, your family as well as yourself do not have any criminal record. So it took two years. And then in 2019, I became a magistrate. And I've been a magistrate for three years in Southwest London. And it's worthwhile? Absolutely. <laughs> My brain is growing, but I don't want to talk more because that's going to be that's in the questions. Gonna, right. OK. Thank you, Dawn. And uh, third, but, but not last, <laughs> or last but not least, is Lynette Whelan, who is a solicitor at a firm called Brown Jacobson. So, Lynette. Hello, everyone. So I'm Lynette, um, and I'm an associate at Brown Jacobson and qualified just over two years ago. Um, so before that, I started as a paralegal at the law firm, got that hands-on, on-the-job sort of work experience and built up my skills from there. And since then, I've been working in the health inquest and advisory team. So we do mental health law and um, court protection work. So that's for people that lack the capacity to make decisions for themselves. Um, and a court will often step in and make a decision in their best interests. Um, if I go back to when I started out in the profession, I was fortunate to be sponsored by the Law Society through their diversity access scheme. And that changed my life in all honesty because it opened many weighty doors um, and gave me the sponsorship to do a course called the Legal Practice Course, which is often quite expensive to do. Mm -hmm. um, since then, I've started as a social mobility ambassador for the Law Society um, just to give others the same opportunity that I had. And um, I act as kind of like a screener for applications and interviews and things like that and to provide mentoring experience for people. If I go back for um, you know, many, many years, 15 years ago, I grew up in Luton, which is a socially disadvantaged area. And like many maybe in this room, I um, came from a working class background. At university was completely alien to me before starting GCSEs. 
My parents hadn't um, been, been educated at university level. I was state school educated and depended on free school meals quite often um, and educational maintenance allowance, which was a bursary at that time for people that were in A-levels. I had also many educational differences sort of going through my school, um, school sort of um, academics. So I really struggled with maths, I really struggled with some of the English, and I struggled with memory. Um, and I really found that a lot of the things that stood out for me were practical examples, and they're the things I can remember today. Book work sort of really went over my head, to be honest. Um, and I was often that child that was sat with the teacher getting the extra time but I hadn't quite realised there was a difference with me. I just realised that I learned differently. Then I went to secondary school um, and a teacher said to me, have you ever considered university? And I, was, I, I think I went and looked it up, to be honest. I didn't know what university was at that stage. Um, I went and did some research and I started looking at careers, probably at the age you are now. Um, and I thought, oh, maybe a law career might be something that I'd be interested in doing. But I had many people at that stage just say, oh no, you know, people like you don't go to do law. People from Luton don't do law, um, and women really especially don't do law. Um, so I got to the age of 16, um, and I had some barriers at that point where I left home not of my own accord, um, and I had no financial support, and I went into a young person's hostel. At that point, I was like, well, you know, you can forget a career in law. Um, I gave up my pipe dream of becoming a lawyer. Um, I didn't have A-levels at that stage. And I left behind many of my peers that were on their journey to, to university. And I thought, my journey stopped here. But little did I know, my journey had only just started. Um, I, when I was living out on my own, I started to get a bit more interested in the way the world worked. And part of that was tenancy-related issues because I had my own tenancy. And I realized law could be a tool to help others um, to learn about their rights. And I was found myself in positions of sort of helping others with that and understanding how legal obligations can impact everyday situations. I took time to explore what I really wanted to do because I knew that law was going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and also quite a bit of financial, um, quite a bit of finances to get there. I knew that I'd have to work very, very hard. I went and did an apprenticeship and I was paid 60 pound per week. Um, then, again, I thought I was an absolute millionaire for getting that. Um, but looking back, it probably wasn't very much. Um, but I did all my food shopping and everything on that. Um, and then I went to study a part-time access course um, whilst I was working at the same time. And I had another job as well on the side, just to sort of get my studying and um, mainly to pay for train fares and things like that, because I studied in London. Um, I realised then that was sort of my own way. I was sort of carving my own path. And I realised that there's no really sort of right way to go. There's just kind of your own way, really. I started at the University of York after doing my access course and completing that, and I was confronted with really rigorous writing and reading demands. And I thought, right, it's taken me hours to read this article when everyone else was going out partying. I thought, well, this isn't happening for me. This, I'm still having to sit and article, read an article late at night. Um, and the welfare office at uni suggested that I might have dyslexia. Um, so I had a full test for that, and I was found to have dyslexia, dyscalculia, and something called Erlen syndrome, which is a visual perception disorder. And dyscalculia is basically dyslexia, but from the form of maths and being able to do maths in your, in your uh, sort of mind. I was given a lot of reasonable adjustments, so assistive technology, printing credits. Um, I got a lot of books, and I was able to sort of make my own, my own notes in books, which was really, really good for me. And... Um, a lot of coaching as well to sort of get around some of the difficulties I was facing in, in the academic world. Um, I stood at careers events despite having all this help and knowing that I got to this stage thinking, you know, I don't think I fit here. I, I just don't feel like I'm the right sort of person for this career. And I was consumed by comparisons. I'd done a non-traditional route. I'd also started university late. Um, I had a disability, dyslexia and dyscalculia, and I didn't have the same finances as everyone else. As I said earlier, I, I then applied to the diversity access scheme. Um, I wasn't aware of you know, where it would lead me, but I just thought, what the hell, I'll give it a go, see where I get to. Um, the diversity access scheme provides financial funding, um, mentoring, and um, work experience for people with barriers in their life. So it could be anything. It could be that you've got a disability. It could be that you're from a non-traditional background. It could be a number of different reasons why you can apply to this, this fund. Um, and from there, I, I, I 
was really on a high, to be honest. Um, I found that my hard work had been valued to that point and that the profession really did value that. And that um, some pretty weighty doors had been opened for me on the next sort of path that I was going on. I then did a paralegal job and then um, applied for a, an assessment day, which is the next stage. So basically, before you go into um, a law firm, you get put on an assessment day if you're becoming a solicitor. And there they put you through some rigorous tasks. Um, you sit in a group exercise, for example, you do an interview. Um, and previously, I'd done a number of these sorts of days and I'd been really, really worried. But then someone turned around to me and just said, you do you. And I was like, hmm, that's a novel concept and maybe I should just do me. And I realised that all the rejections and the well-meaning advice that I'd been given um, brought me to a realisation. I didn't escape um, the world I knew and the energy, I didn't go into law to escape the world I knew and the energy that I tried to fit in was absolutely wasted. The two worlds, my background and the profession could come together and they could merge. The challenges that I'd seen and faced built resilience the people that I'd met along the way were my support network and I'd built communication skills. And the workarounds that I got from my dyslexia and dyscalculia and coping with all of that um, were actually building creativity. And all I needed to do was to tell a recruiter that and they'd realise that I had something to bring to the profession. So if I have any tips for anyone here, it's to not let your background hold you back. You can build skills that are different to everyone else just by innate virtue of having a very different route. Um, stay passionate. Be very patient as well and persevere with your journey. Have the courage to be yourself and bring that to the work that you love. Thank you. Wow. Well, that was a, that was a great start, I say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lynette. Well, now you know the panel, you know uh, who we are. Let's hear from you. And I think we're going to start the questions with Westminster City School. Where, where's, where are you sitting? Are you? Great. And I think somebody's going to bring a mic and we're going to have our first question from Westminster City School. If you want, if you feel like it, stand up, tell us who you are and give us your question. Um, oh. My name is Andre Barta and my question is, what has been the hardest decision you have had to handle in your law career? Great question. I'm going to start with Caroline. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, so thanks for that question. Um, and thanks for introducing yourself as well. Um, so there's a well-known fact amongst all lawyers, certainly in private practice, that you will always have a case that will either make you or break you. <laughs> um, and I certainly have one memorable case. Luckily, it made me, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, it involved a very, um, a very disabled 13-year-old girl. Um, her mum and family loved, loved her dearly and wanted nothing more uh, than to care for her, to for have her to live with them and for them to care for her um, for the rest of her days. However, her care needs were so high um, that it meant that she needed 24-hour nursing care by two trained nursing staff. So that's 24 hours, seven days a week, literally, you know, someone monitoring her all the time. Um, with the best will in the world, um, the mum and the extended family would just simply have been unable to meet her needs. However, there was a big conflict. Um, all the professionals and the experts in the case, uh, sorry, I represented the 13-year-old girl and she had a financial deputy that Lynette might have been involved in. Um, all the professionals and the experts in the case uh, were strongly recommending uh, residential nursing care. For the, for the girl, where she would have 24-hour access to emergency medical assistance, uh, doctors, nurses, specialists, rehab professionals. And the family were essentially arguing to bring her home um, where they could um, care for her in, in their own family home. It was a hugely emotionally driven case, as you can imagine, and every single professional and expert involved could wholeheartedly see um, the, the mum's argument. You know, I mean, I'm a mum now, wasn't then, but I am now, and, and, and I've placed myself in her shoes, and I can't imagine anything, anything worse. We most probably agreed, um, so everybody most probably agreed with her on a personal level. However, the needs of the child had, had to be put first. And as her lawyer, it was my job to ensure that her health 
and well-being best interests were kept in the centre of every discussion, every debate, every meeting. We always had to bring ourselves back to this child. What is in her best interest? We, we couldn't act as parents. It wasn't our job to do that. Ultimately, the case went to trial. We actually sat in this very building, actually, and had an eight-day trial. The judge in the case was very compassionate. Um, he was hugely complimentary of the mother, which was important. It was important to everyone involved, the, all lawyers on all sides, barristers on all sides. Um, this mother wasn't doing anything wrong. She was, she was being a mum. So it was very important that she was given that, that respect, and she was. The judge acknowledged that the mum was in a privileged position when it came to the care of her own child. However, it was ultimately decided that it was the court's responsibility to override the consent of the mum, as to not do so would have placed the child at significant harm. So that case, without doubt, moulded me. It's, it stuck with me for years and it will stick with me for the rest of my career. Um, it helped confirm my values and beliefs of the hugely important role, not just lawyers, but the whole legal system is there to do. And it's to give voices to those people who can't speak for themselves. Thank you, Caroline. Dawn, do you want to say something about this topic? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, when this topic was suggested as a question, I, I read it in a personal capacity and not in a business. And in life, we are always going to come across challenges, barriers, and a lot of maybe bereavement as well. And the question reads is, what has been the hardest decision or problem you've had to handle? And when I, when I was 16, my dad was killed and I found his body. And that was just an awful, awful period of my life. And that was a change of my life because I then started to believe that I needed to walk in my dad's shoes. Today I'm wearing this blazer, which is older than me, <laughs> and I'm in my 50s. This was made before, before I was born. And that's what I take as moving positively forward. That was a hard decision. You can go either way. You can go left or you can go right. It depends on what you want to do, because everyone that you meet will always have a challenge that has happened. Um, and my decision was, what do I want to do with my life? Do I want to, do I want to let my dad down? And obviously I'm sitting here for a reason, because I chose the right path. So that for me was the hardest decision I had to make Thank at you. that young age. Thank you, Dawn. Should we have question two from Westminster? Hi, my name is Dan. Uh, what was it like studying law and working at the same time? Was it stressful? Lynette, you're the obvious person to answer that question. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was absolutely quite stressful. <laughs> um, there's no doubt about it. And I think the one thing that really helped me get through was I used to kind of visualise myself at the end of that path and what I was going to gain from it. Um, so I remember doing a mood board and things like that, you, you know, just putting pictures up of what I wanted to achieve. Um, and I had to even cut friends out of my life for that year where I had three jobs doing my access course um, and just say to them, look, I'm really sorry, but right now, you know, I can't be out, you know, socialising. It was really hard work. Um, but, you know, if it's got an end date, it's got an end date. And that means that, you know, you can, you can go to uni. And actually, when you get to uni, there are lots of grants and financial, there's a lot of financial support available. So at that point, you know, it's a little bit easier. You don't have to do the three jobs. So depending on where you're at, um, sometimes it can be a bit easier along the way. But I would say, yeah, it, it's difficult. Um, but, you know, if you know where you want to be, then it's totally possible. Thank you. Question three from Westminster. Hi, my name's Eliza. My question is, what was it like moving up in the different sectors of law? And what did, what did you find during it? Great. Dawn, do you <laughs> want to start? Um, I didn't set out to do law. It kind of came in my mind when I was like 16 and what direction, obviously, I've said what I wanted to do. Um, but I was working at McDonald's. I was also a lobby hostess. So by the time I'd left McDonald's at the age of 20, I was on about £2.50, I think, then, <laughs> and still feeling pretty ripped. And then I worked for Nationwide Building Society for 30 years. 
And during that time, there are a lot of laws that we need to know as employees, and that's money laundering, data protection, proceeds of crime, because they all affect banks and builder societies because people come in and might want to launder money. Does everybody understand what laundering money is? Right. There's, low, there's a great show on Netflix called The Ozark, if anybody's seen it. <laughs> I know it's for 18, but it, it gives an ex perfect example about why not to, money, to launder money. So then I left Nationwide and decided I wanted to be a magistrate. Yes, the amount of transition is quite, quite intensive. But if you're determined, anything in life, if you're determined, you can do anything you want to do. And that's what my dad said to me when I was younger. So moving from McDonald's nationwide and into the judiciary takes a lot of determination. That's what I would say. You do have to say goodbye to a few friends for a few times, you know, maybe years, but you guys can do it. You're sitting here. <laughs> Caroline. Yeah, I, I mean, I think moving up um, in the legal sector or any sector, to be fair, mm -hmm. I think it's one of those things it's hard to appreciate at the time that you're increasing your seniority uh, because certainly from my experience, progression and recognition tends to happen after a series of small events, so it, it, you, which aren't that obvious um, at the time, especially when you're in the thick of it. And even, you know, I remember being in, in your position um, where you are now and not really being <laughs> fully, you know, didn't have a clear path. Um, I had a rough idea, but it was more about going out and having fun, to be fair. Um, it, 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 it really, it's only when you look back, you see how far you come, which I appreciate is very cliche. Mm -hmm. And you're probably rolling your eyes a bit and going, oh, she's, she's saying one of those things we hear all the time. But it is really true. It's one thing my parents always said to me is, every now and again, just, just pause look back over your shoulder and just look where you've come from. Um, you, you, there'll always be bumps in the road. It's inevitable. It's just life. Um, you're always going to have some adversities, setbacks, challenges, um, but they absolutely do shape you um, and they are unavoidable, but they're actually needed to, to propel you forward um, onto the next big thing. Um, you know, you mentioned being competitive. I mean, I don't think, honestly, I'd be sat here today if I wasn't as competitive and didn't sharpen my elbows and Get, get, my, get my foot in, in the door. Uh, but what I've learned from working in different sectors is, is whether that's the legal sector, rehab sector, the fitness industry, is that there's, it's people's lives um, that you're dealing with. And that's an incredible privilege and responsibility. And that, that will always be something that, that sticks with you. So I'll just add my, I, I haven't really worked in different legal sectors, but I've moved up through the profession. And one of the things that I would say is, when you start a role, so I started as a junior barrister, and I looked at the more senior barristers and I thought, oh God, I'll, I'll never, I'll never be able to do that. And then I worked hard and I uh, established a practice. My practice was in discrimination law, employment law, and then I started do doing some tax law. I acted a lot for HMRC. Um, and each time I did something new, I thought, oh, I'll never be able to do that. And there was a little voice in my head saying, why do you even think you can do that? Um, and I thought each time I got, I became the revenue junior, I thought, oh, I'm going to be found out now. This is the time I'm going to make a fool of myself. I'll go into court. I won't have an answer or a solicitor will ask me to give advice and the advice will be wrong, I'll be negligent. And I keep, kept working and I kept not being found out and I kept not being sued for negligence. Uh, and I became a QC. I thought, God, QCs, they're so clever and they're so confident. I can never be a QC. And then I was a QC. This is the time I'm going to be found out. <laughs> and I wasn't. And then I thought, after however many years I've been a QC, maybe I could be a judge. Maybe I've got something to offer. Oh, but God, judges are so clever. <laughs> and they're so confident and they know what they're doing. And this little voice kept saying, what makes you think that you can be a judge? So I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. I'll apply. It doesn't matter if I don't get it the first time. It will be a really good learning experience. 
And then I became a judge. And I thought, okay, now you really pushed it this time, Simla. You're really going to be found out. <laughs> and I wasn't. And I think we've just got to be courageous. We've got to tell that voice that's sitting on our shoulders saying, you can't do it. What makes you think that you're as good as those other people? To shut up. And we've got to be courageous and we've got to get out there and just keep doing it. And as, um, uh, as Caroline said, you, you each, at each point where you achieve the next step, you can look back and you can say, that's what I did. That's the body of evidence I can use to show that actually I can be the barrister or the solicitor or the legal executive or whatever it is you choose to be. And you've just got to keep moving forwards. So thank you very much for that question. I think the next questions are coming from St. Michael's Catholic College. Um, hello, my name is Deborah. Um, and my question is, how well are you able to put your own moral convictions aside in dealing with controversial legal issues? Thank you for that question. Lynette, do you want to start with that question? Yeah, I think um, Caroline touched on this earlier. So um, it's quite, it's quite um, challenging in the law because you do come across different different um, scenarios where um, it may be a criminal case if you're a criminal barrister or it may be challenging scenarios where you think you know you know what might be in the person's best interest and as I mentioned earlier I do court protection work so that's when the court often steps in to make decisions for people when they don't have the capacity to make decisions for themselves in certain areas so it can be about care it can be about residence it can be about um, so where they live, it can be about um, medical treatment decisions. And quite often we're faced with situations where families are disagreeing about what's best for a patient um, and they're trying to decide what's better. And families really want that person back home because they want to see their last days out at home. And we have to make the difficult um, decision sometimes or the court has to make the difficult decision as to whether that can actually happen in reality. So whether there's enough care and financial unfortunately funding available to fund that care available so from a personal perspective I always find it quite challenging um, to see families really wanting their their you know their nana or their their granddad home but unfortunately because they haven't got either the person at home that can care for them to supplement a care package or um, family are disagreeing and perhaps there's too much conflict if that person was to go home and the court is you know, asked to make that decision, I find that quite challenging because I really feel for those families. Um, but as Caroline mentioned earlier, it's about giving those families the opportunity to be heard. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. And the other thing I would say is you're very aware of the fact that you're operating within a framework and you've got professional responsibilities to the court to provide evidence, to allow the families to be heard, to allow the doctors to be heard so that you know that that person's going to get the right care. And that always fills me with some sort of confidence that um, no matter what the decision is, ultimately it's going to be you know, the right decision because the court is always going to act in that person's best interest, um, providing that we give them as much evidence as possible. Thank you. Dawn. Um, as you know, I'm a magistrate, which I've been for three years. And when I decided to apply, I had to think to myself, are there going to be issues that are going to be quite emotive for me because 90% of all cases or crimes come through the magistrate's court. And that could include knife crime, drugs, murder, and then they get sent up to whether it's the Crown Court or to the Old Bailey. And um, there's been an instance with a young lady that came in and she was living in outside London and she was a sort of a drug mule to gangs in, in S, an SW area. And she had been assaulted and she had been raped. So as well as being, having done criminal acts, she was also a victim. And that's the dilemma because as magistrates, we are there to collect the protect the public, because that's our ultimate aim, to protect the public within our community. 
But we felt that this young lady needed protecting away from the gangs because they were just had this ultimate hold over her. Um, but luckily, her sister came and said that she would look after her, she would ensure that she was protected because the option was to actually put her in jail to protect her. So that was a really difficult time for us as magistrates. We've got a victim, but we've also got a perpetrator. Um, drugs is the bane of society. Um, it's really just stay clear of it because it will affect and ruin your life. Thank you. Um, when I was at the bar, uh, one of the things I decided to try for was to become a part-time judge. Um, in the criminal courts, part-time judges are called recorders. And I became a recorder in about 2000 and, oh God, it's a long time ago, two, 2002. And one of the first cases I tried, I mean, I was terrified. One of the first cases, it, actually, it wasn't a trial that made me so terrified. It was a sentencing, was a young man he just got his place at university. He had done his A-levels. He'd done really well. And he had come up with this brilliant scheme to, learn, to earn money for himself, which was to forge Tesco vouchers. And what he used to do is he, and he did it really well. He had the hologram and everything. And what he used to do is he'd go into Tesco's with the voucher, present the voucher, get some CDs or DVDs. I can't remember what was the thing in those days. And then he'd take them to the game shop and say um, this was a present and try and, and get the money back for the, for the DVD or the CD. And he had created 40,000 pounds worth of Tesco vouchers. They were found in his possession when he was caught. Uh, and he came before me as a very, very junior recorder. He was 80, he was the same age as one of my kids. And he had parents who obviously cared and loved for him, and they had given him the best education they could. And he was going to university. He wanted to be an accountant. And a criminal offense for fraud, all the judges said, you've got to send him to prison. And I so didn't want to send this boy, 18 years old, same age as my son to prison, but I had to because that's what was required. And that was, that very first sentence I passed, I, re I remember that boy, I remember his parents. I thought of him every day in the first few weeks of his sentence, because when you become a part-time judge, part of your training is they take you to prison uh, and to a young offenders institution and they show you what happens. They show you how the person is processed from the minute they arrive in the prison. What happens? They come to this room. This is where they're uh, checked and they're taught, they're spoken to about their mental health in order to see if they're a suicide risk and all the, and then they're shown to their cell. This is what the cell looks like. And I lived that first week or two thinking what this young boy, who obviously did a very serious, he, he committed a serious offence, Would what would happen to him? And I've thought about him and I've wondered about him ever since. But that was, for me, that was one of the hardest decisions where what I wanted to do as a human being and a mother conflicted with what I had to do as a judge. Uh, next question from St. Michael's College. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Gerard. And my question is, are there any judicial pre precedents that you personally do not agree with? Oh, that's, a, that's quite a difficult question, uh, especially for me as a judge. There are, I mean, I, I now sit in the Court of Appeal. And in the Court of Appeal, we mostly deal with, legal, with appeals on points of law. Um, when I was a first instance judge, I would be the first instance decision maker. So I would decide the facts and then I would apply the facts to the law and I would come out with a decision. And my decisions were appealed. 
And very often, I was overturned, or not very often, but sometimes I was overturned. And when I was overturned, that means the Court of Appeal disagreed with me, I would read the judgment. Sometimes I would think, yeah, that's right. I got it wrong on that occasion. But sometimes I would think, actually, I still think I was right. And the best times were when the case then went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court disagreed with the Court of Appeal and said, actually, Simla J was right. Um, but it is, it's one of those things. You actually feel comforted by the fact that there is this other higher court that will, if you've got it wrong, put it right. That's, and if, if you can sort of get rid of the personal sense of disagreement, irritation, um, whatever it is, then you can find some comfort in the fact that, that, that justice will be done at whatever level it will be done. Um, so thank you for that difficult question. Um, the other members of the panel are not, don't sit as judges, so uh, I don't think they want to <laughs> contribute to this one. <laughs> Shall we have the next question from St. Michael's? Hi, I'm Cecilia. Um, how long on average does it take to make a judicial uh, decision? Ah, that's interesting. Well, uh, let me start. Maybe Dawn will, will also uh, <laughs> contribute as a magistrate. For me, making the decision doesn't take that long. Very often I'll read uh, either, um, I, I, I deal with criminal appeals and civil appeals. And when I deal with criminal appeals, we'll have, actually, I'm, I'm sitting on criminal appeals this week. So tomorrow I've got a list of four appeals. Um, they're all appeals against sentence. They're people who say that the sentence that was passed by the judge was manifestly excessive. That's the test in uh, criminal sentencing appeals. Uh, and my job as the appeal court with my members, I sit as a panel of three, will be to look at the sentence, to look at the guidelines that are relevant to that sentence, and to decide whether there is a case for saying it, that the sentence was manifestly excessive. Uh, in a, a civil case, it will be a... a um, I'm just trying to think what I've just, I, recently I dealt with a tax appeal. Um, the, the appeal lasted for five days and there were three broad questions um, and they were to do with a tax avoidance scheme and whether the taxpayer should have paid the tax or whether uh, he should be um, allowed not to pay the tax for various reasons around the avoidance scheme. And whether it's criminal or civil, it doesn't take me very long to decide. Um, I form a preliminary view and then I listen to the arguments and then I have a decision. What takes a long time, especially in civil, is writing the decision because you've got to set out the uh, facts, you've got to set out the law, you've got to set out the decision below, you've got to set out the arguments and then you've got to analyze and discuss uh, your uh, reasons and your conclusions. And that can take a long time. And when you're sitting in civil as a member of a panel of three, once you've written your draft judgment, you've got to send it to your colleagues, the other two judges who sat on the appeal, appeal with you. And that's sort of like getting your homework marked, <laughs> quite scary. And you send it off and you think, oh, this is what I think. Ah, this is when I'm going to be found out. They're mm -hmm. going to say this is complete rubbish. We've got to start all over again. And then, and I have one sleepless night, and then the messages come back. We, we agree with what you've said. Sometimes they give some helpful suggestions. You could strengthen paragraph 134. You could say this in paragraph 166. And then finally, we have a judgment that we all agree with. So it's the writing that takes time rather than the decision making. Um, Dawn, what about you? Um, with magistrates, as, like judges, we have our own sentencing guidelines and we also have a legal advisor to point any issues with regards to the law. 
So if we have a trial, it's a one-day trial or a two-day trial, at the end, the magistrate, which is normally a panel of at least three of us, sometimes it's been two, we will then decide, and it's always based on the majority, and then obviously from the sentencing guidelines, we'll look at the harm that was caused, and that bears its fact, and if there's any mitigation as well. So it's quite straightforward. At the end of a trial, we would set, set aside the time during that afternoon to provide our sentence. So at least the individual knows before they leave court what our decision is, and if they wish to appeal, then that's entirely up to them. So it's all done after the trial on the same days. Thank you. Next question, I think still from um, St. Michael's. Um, hi, my name is Faith, and my question is, what was the most important factor that influenced your decision to become a judge? Well, I think, again, it'll be me and Dawn on this one. Mm -hmm. For me, I'd, I'd been a barrister for, I think I said, 30 years, just about 30 years. And I felt it's quite unusual at the age of 50 to have a chance to have a different career, another, a new career. But that's one of the advantages of the legal profession. You can do these different things. And I felt it was time to give something back. So that, for me, um, that was a very important factor. The other thing for me, I had argued cases for all those years as a barrister. So sometimes your case had merit. Sometimes it didn't really have merit. You have no choice uh, as to which side you're going to appear on. You have to appear on the side that instructs you. And so you have to put forward the best argument you can for your client. But it's not necessarily the right answer, and it's not necessarily the one with the most merit. And so what I thought would be um, a privilege and something different was to, instead of going into the case and putting forward the best argument you can, could on the facts, was to identify the right answer and to give an answer that would be right for all people affected by that particular uh, problem. So there are judicial review cases which challenge, for example, uh, the Department of Work and Pensions approach to benefits or uh, uh, HMRC, the revenues approach to tax issues. So coming up with the right answer, I thought, would be a very uh, good thing and a very rewarding thing to do. So that was the second real reason. And then finally, I had always argued about the lack of uh, diverse representation on the bench when I was at the bar. I was on the bar council and we were campaigning for a more representative judiciary. And I thought I had to put my money where my mouth was and try and join the judiciary to be a woman in the judiciary. So that was my, my third reason. And that's exactly my reason. Um, I'm obviously a black female and I became a magistrate at 51 by the time they've done all the backroom background yeah. checks and everything. Um, do I feel 51? <laughs> do I act 51? No. <laughs> um, so age is a number. You might have heard that before, but it is. But if I'd had a chance, I would have gone into the judiciary a lot younger, but I don't feel that I've missed out because I've had a journey which I can speak about. And you're pleased you're there and you I'm love really it. pleased. So Look, I'm here. Keep it in mind. This it's is fantastic. A, a great thing to do. It's fantastic. Twickenham School, where are you? Let's have the first question from Twickenham School. Um, I'm Hattie. Uh, and my question is, do you believe there is still a need to actively campaign for women in law? Caroline. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, there's been some good progress made in recent years, um, but there's still a lot of work to do around um, equality or inequality, depending on which way you look at it. Um, it's important that women leaders continue to um, kick open doors. Some do need kicking more than others, um, especially for those that are coming behind us. Um, and whilst I do campaign for women in law, I also campaign for social mobility, as Lynette 
uh, mentioned is that actually that's something that's a much deeper issue for society um, and the public. Uh, I'm a firm believer that the legal sector, um, including the judiciary, should represent the communities they serve uh, and champion those, especially from non-traditional um, education routes in particular, certainly in, again in the legal sector. So career in law should, in my view, should be open to all, uh, not just those who went to university, for example. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done around equality and it's, it's, for me, it's maintaining the momentum. It's all our responsibility, it's a shared responsibility to ensure that the conversation is continued in everything that we do. Here, here to that. <laughs> Second question from Twickenham. Um, hello, my name is Amon Vip, uh, and my question is, what are the main differences when taking cases before and after COVID? Lynette, do you want to just talk about that? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think, um, especially dealing with Inquest, which is part of the role that I deal with, um, so everything has been online, um, so any Inquest are typically, typically online, and we've got families attending those hearings, um, we've, got, um, we've got families, we've got professionals so we've got medics as well the ambulance service police and um, what can be quite challenging about that is you cannot really get the same body language from people mm. across a, a video um, and quite often I would say to people as part of my prep previously prior to COVID make sure you look at the judge's pen so that you know whether you're going too fast or too slow well there's no judge's pen now is there so you, you have to tell people to say look at the body language and um, check for pauses make sure you're speaking slowly it's a lot harder to judge these things mm. over a camera. Mm. Um, and the other thing really is just about it becoming a lot more flexible. Um, there's been flexible working, working from home. Um, everything's become a bit more relaxed in terms of dress as well. Um, and that's happened across businesses, but it's also happening in law, which means that um, we are attracting more, a more diverse pool of candidates as well. And um, because you can fit your work around your home life and whatever else um, you've got going on. So that's positive. Thank you. Third question from Twickenham. Hello, my name is Hermione, and this question is for Lynette Wheeland. What interested you in mental health law? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I used to do a lot of voluntary work um, for young people that were homeless um, and also in the law centre, so um, helping others with tenancy-related issues mainly. Um, and I found that sort of mental health affects everyone. It can affect, I think it's one in three of us nowadays. Um, and there's a real balance between protecting um, the person, but also upholding their rights and making sure that they have the ability to make decisions for themselves. Um, so that was one of the aspects that I really sort of enjoyed about it. And then when I went to university, I did um, a module in law and medical ethics and a dissertation on euthanasia. And again, um, there was a balance between ethical principles, protection of the public, and protection for individuals as well, to make sure that they're making that decision for themselves in the right circumstances, and they're not just doing it because of a, a poor sort of um, place where they are in their life at that time. Um, I find the practice really, really challenging, but um, it, no two problems are really the same. And also, uh, it can often be a big factor in court protection cases where people um, have, say, dementia, but they can also develop mental health conditions. It's a really interesting and challenging area of law. And I think for me, um, I didn't know that it existed until I actually got into a training contract and then did a bit of health law and then realised there was this niche. But I absolutely love it. And there's an awful lot of regulation that goes around it as well. And I get really sort of into that. So for me, it's complex, challenging, and you're also dealing with everyday problems as well. Thank you. Last question from Twickenham. Hi, my name is Petya, and my question is, what is it like as a woman to work in a male-dominated field such as law? Caroline, do you want to answer yeah. that? So it's definitely changed over the years. Mm. Um, when I first entered the profession in 1996, um, it was undoubtedly much more male-dominated uh, than it is now. Uh, seeing the diversity and inclusion changes gives me great hope for the future. For the future careers of those of you here today, um, and, and for that, you know, my daughter's five, so I hope by the time she's your age, things have changed even more. Um, there's some fantastic female role models um, in the legal sector. Take this panel today as a prime example. Um, and I think all of us here will agree um, 
that we are standing on the shoulders of people who came yeah. before us. Mm -hmm. um, professionals who prided themselves on their independence, their skills, and because they were drawn from all corners of our society, which is just key. I think providing women with access to mentors, uh, the right kind of networking opportunities, involving men in the equality debate are all essential. Uh, the last point I will just say is that we all have a responsibility to ensure that there are more women role models in senior positions. Uh, we have to keep opening new doors, not just for ourselves, but of course for the people that are following our footsteps. And I think that for me, yes, it's great to have the opportunities for ourselves, but what's more important is the people that are coming behind us. And I say amen to that. <laughs> Heathcote School. Where are you? You're there. Let's have the first question. Hi, my name is Kinga, and my question is, do you have any tips on confidence in the courtroom? Ah, let's have Lynette. I remember at uh, university, I was standing outside a talk by a set of barristers' chambers, and I remember feeling like I couldn't go in. And it was a really strange feeling, because I kept walking past the door, walking back up the corridor, and then thinking, I don't fit in there. Um, so for me, I think I always had um, difficulties with confidence, but I don't think that ever really goes away. Because even today, I was sort of sat there last night worrying about what I should say and why do these people really want to listen to me? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of imposter feeling, which you will have heard probably before, you're more prone to, especially if you've got a different background, disability from different ethnicities, um, it can creep up on you a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and there's females in the profession as well. Um, I often liken it to, you know, that feeling that you hear about with actors. So if they're going on stage, quite often they will get sick or, or feel sick prior to going on stage. Um, some of my tips would be um, always prepare. And I think there's that famous saying, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Mm -hmm. So preparation is always key because you'll feel a lot more confident mm -hmm. on the day. Um, one of the things my friend told me to do recently was um, the power pose by Amy Cuddy. <laughs> so, you know, you put your hands on your waist, you stand up tall. Yes. That's meant to increase the good feeling hormones in your body and make you feel really confident. And believe me, I do stand there and do that um, in my bedroom prior to getting on camera sometimes for things like this. It definitely helps. Um, and smile as well, because sometimes that can trigger good feelings. Um, one of the things I was told during my training contract was fake it until you make it. Yeah. <laughs> it is so true. Um, even if you're not feeling it, you know, just put on that smile, put on those clothes and just go out there and fake it. Um, and I still feel like I'm doing that today. Um, and the other thing is to make time for you. It's not all about work. It's about having a healthy work-life balance. So, you know, exercise, good food, good sleep. Make sure you make time for that because they're the absolute basics. And without those you often find that other things slip. Mm -hmm. So that'd be my tip. So I agree with everything Lynette has said. Me too. Uh, second question. Hi, my name is Hosanna. My question is, how do you prepare for an argument in court? Well, I think I'll uh, answer this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, was, I prepared very thoroughly because I was worried I was going to be found out. <laughs> so I probably over-prepared. But what I would do is I would prepare my argument and then I would think about what arguments the other side were going to advance and what my answers were to those. And then what might the judge say? Because even if the other side, your opponent, doesn't identify the best argument for his or her case, you can be sure that the judge will ask you the question. So I used to have um, a little folder and I would have thought of all the possible questions that I might be asked. And because I was so scared that I wouldn't remember or wouldn't know the answer when it came into the courtroom because I would be um, too anxious, I would write out the answers and I would have post-it notes so that when the difficult question was asked, all I had to do was look down at my folder, there's the post-it note, I turn to that post-it. And there was my answer. So, I mean, I think the, an the real answer is preparation. Um, you've just got to prepare, prepare, and then prepare again. Third question from Heathcote. We're running short of time, so we'll deal with these. Questions. Hi, my name is Thomas, and I was wondering, what's the biggest challenge you've had to face in your careers? What's the biggest challenge? Lynette? Uh, 
it was quite a personal challenge for me. So I lost my father during my training contract, which was quite a, a big, big personal challenge. He was the person that I saw as my role model. Um, but alongside that, I was also dealing with medical cases that dealt with cancer and other topics, and that was what he passed away with. So for me, um, I always found that a huge, huge challenge trying to deal with those topics. Um, but one of the things I did to get over it is just kind of realise that, um, you know, that I was, you know, as Dawn said earlier, you kind of make, you, you have two choices. You either make that person proud or you let it sink you. And for me, what I really wanted to do was show, show him that, you know, I could still carry on living and do the things that I wanted to do and qualify eventually. So that was one of my personal challenges for you. Final question. Um, from him. Hello, uh, my name is Manny. Um, my question is, what's your favourite part about having a career in law? Great question. Well, let's let's have something from each member of the panel. Uh, uh, the transferable squ skills, skills even, um, are unquantifiable. Um, a career in the law will mean that you are a problem solver, uh, a mediator, master draftsman uh, of documents, an English language expert, an absolute world-class organiser. Um, you will probably qualify for an Olympic gold medal in preparation and time <laughs> management. And you will often be a counsellor and a friendly <laughs> ear to many. So that's Thank what you. I would say. <laughs> Lynette. And every day is different. Brilliant. For me, it's problem solving. I think you are able to help people and to solve a problem for them that they couldn't help uh, or solve themselves. I agree with all of that, including the fact that my age, my grey skills are enhanced. Yeah. I'm learning so much that I never thought could happen. And that's a great, uh, it's a great thing to do. Yeah, it's always challenging. Yeah. It's rewarding, it's intellectually demanding. But it's great. Uh, and it's great. So I hope that this panel has inspired all of you to think that a career in law is an option for you, no matter what your personal background is. And I hope that even, uh, that, that all of you will think about a career in law and that at some point you might even think about a career on the bench and one day either be in this courtroom, on that side of the courtroom speaking uh, or advising your clients who are on this side of the courtroom uh, as judges. So I just want to thank all of you for the great questions that you contributed, um, for listening uh, to <coughs> us uh, answer those questions, and also to Yvonne Richards, who's the Director of Learning at Young Citizens, for all her help. There she is. Sorry, I didn't see you. Thank you, Yvonne, for all your help in organising this event, and also to the um, members of the Judicial Office who've helped organise this event. So thank you. And finally, to my panel members, to Caroline, to Lynette, and to Dawn, thank uh, you all for joining me today. So Can, thank you. May I just add one little thing? This is a question about disability, race, gender. Don't let anything stop you. Don't let the naysayers, the barriers, regardless of your colour, disability. I've been disabled since 2017. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't let any barriers get in my way. Okay? So that's my parting. Well done. Here, here.